Hi everyone. Um, just going to wait for the rest of the folks to sign it on. It's a couple of minutes till we'll probably get started in two minutes. Thank you for finding the Zoom location. We'll get started soon. Okay, well, it is six o'clock. I imagine that a few more people might join us. We are a small group, this uh, cohort that's entering. I think we may be divided into a couple of different sections. Uh, thank you for the hellos in the chat, everyone. I appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna start off by just doing a quick introduction. I know uh, on the Brightspace platform, you probably already saw the introductory video to the course, so hopefully you saw that um, by now. But I also wanted to personally uh, introduce myself to all of you in this section and maybe get a chance to know some of you if you're willing. Um, you don't have to, uh, but it'd be great to hear from some of you. So uh, I am a biostatistician and epidemiologist by training. And uh, what you see behind me here is not my house. <laughs> um, it's an office. I'm actually based in Seattle, Washington. And um, most recently I was um, working in the Department of Surgery at the University of Washington here in Seattle. And I'm really thrilled to be back teaching uh, full time in the classroom. So. Um, I had previously taught at Mercyhurst University, which <laughs> if you're from, from San Diego, you've probably not heard of it, but it's in uh, Western Pennsylvania, not too far from Pittsburgh. And I had the good fortune of being able to travel back home for the first time in three years, uh, including getting to visit um, some folks back at Mercyhurst this past weekend. So. Uh, that's kind of fresh on my mind. So this online learning environment is new to uh, some of you, I'm sure, and it's uh, uh, relatively new to me. I've been teaching online now uh, for this first year um, since February. So, uh, and we're all adjusting to this new Brightspace learning platform, which I hope you find um, to be organized fairly uh, straightforwardly. Uh, for, if you didn't know this, we used to use Blackboard. In fact, the last time I taught this course, which was two sessions ago, we were still on Blackboard. And now we're over in Brightspace. And I expect that everything will go smoothly. Uh, there could be content that maybe is hidden or things like that <laughs> along the way. But I did make sure that all of the links are there and, and everything that you need is there. Um, but if, if I do uh, 
send out an announcement saying, oh, hey, I forgot to include this in week three. Uh, that's probably because we just transitioned over to Brightspace, but I don't expect that to happen. And one thing I wanted to do today is just make sure that you all know what's expected in this course and also give you an opportunity to ask questions about the program. I know for most of you, this is your first course, along with possibly um, taking uh, the uh, COH 600 course on the healthcare system. And so uh, one reason I push the sessions to Thursday night is we always seem to have a conflict with that course, with doing live sessions. And in this course, uh, because it's a one and a half credit hour course, the expectations are somewhat different than for typical courses. One of the most notable is that it is a pass fail class. So you can kind of <laughs> relax a little bit that way. Um, and the goal really is to get you set up for success for later courses. Uh, and to get in some good habits and get used to using this online learning platform. Uh, and also to introduce you to some of the opportunities within our program. As I mentioned, I'm coming from a traditional program and as, for as much as possible, I like to um, provide some of the opportunities and experiences that you do get from in-person learning. But I also appreciate that all of you are very, very busy. And so I will try to make good use of our time uh, and make sure that you um, have the resources that you need to be successful in this program. And that's ultimately my goal in this course. But also um, we use this 599 course as a way to um, assign uh, students to advisors within the program. So you have an academic advisor already that you um, can help you navigate with registration and things like that. From an academic standpoint, uh, unless you want to change it later, I will actually be your advisor on the academic side as well. So it's also a way to get introduced um, to some of you. So it looks like we have a small group tonight, <laughs> um, and that's fine. I don't, ex this is not a required session, these Thursday night sessions, and I do appreciate that we have a lot of people who are uh, deployed uh, far away. There are people who work um, different shifts and so on, and so um, I don't expect to have full attendance, but we do uh, record any of these live sessions as a university, we are moving towards a purely asynchronous model, uh, meaning that there aren't live sessions. And so um, do use this opportunity to um, ask questions and kind of feel some connection with your peers and feel some connection with faculty. And I'm going to introduce you to, um, not today, but um, over the course of the course, introduce you to the Public Health Student Organization, uh, introduce you to some of the faculty. I'm also gonna have a guest presenter uh, who's a student who will talk a little bit about their experience with doing a capstone project or a independent project. And um, I think that's one of the things that is most valuable in pursuing a master's of public health is the ability to pursue your own interests um, some of you <laughs> might find that kind of scary to have to come up with your own topics for research, but I'm sure most of you who decided to continue in public health or just perhaps switch to public health, um, you have, you probably already have identified some core things that interest you and our goal will be to help kind of um, not only make it possible, but also to kind of help you to um, navigate some resources to make that happen. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about doing PubMed searches online. Uh, PubMed is a really useful way to get um, research articles that maybe of interest to you and can help you think more deeply about a topic. And unlike other disciplines where you have to go hunting high and low for different resources, um, PubMed, which we'll discuss today is really a kind of one-stop shopping, which is kind of nice. 
All right, so um, looks like we've got <laughs> as many as we're gonna get tonight and uh, um, I'm just gonna move forward. So the agenda for tonight was, first of all, just to welcome all of you. Uh, let's see, and uh, we'll do some brief introductions here in a moment. I'm also gonna give you uh, an overview of the course uh, in a little more detail in terms of due dates and things like that. You should have already read the syllabus um, by now, uh, but I wanted to make it more clear that it is really just a guideline as far as the due dates. I would like to be able to give you some feedback on your early assignments. So um, I do have due dates. Ultimately though, for this course, everything is due at the end of the four weeks. I also appreciate that you have maybe more strict deadlines for your other course that you're taking now in public health. So the deadlines aren't strict, but I, I do think it's important to get in good habits and to kind of follow uh, week by week. So we'll talk about that. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna use PubMed uh, to do some searches. I'll we'll talk a little bit about advising and then we'll go into Q&A. So that's the... Um, the structure for tonight. And if you have any questions, uh, you feel free to chime in. Um, you can also use the chat feature. I don't know if all of you are, it seems like most of you are Zoom pros by now, <laughs> I would think. At first, I'm sure it was a little awkward. Okay, so um, if you don't mind, and this is <laughs> voluntary, but if you could uh, unmute and unmic or on mic, unmute and un make your video up here um, and give us your name, where you live. I don't mean it specifically exactly, but like, you know, what city or state, um, where you're from, if not, where you're living now. Um, something about your career, uh, professional life, past or future. So uh, maybe what you're currently doing, or things you hope to be doing soon or things you anticipate um, as you move forward in your careers. Uh, and then a little something about your best class. And <laughs> I don't expect it to necessarily be an academic class. It could be something you did on the side, um, something you did for fun. I'll share that my favorite class ever was a graphic design class. Um, I kind of wish I would have done that at one point because <laughs> it was so fun. But I also hear it's really hard to find jobs in that area. So maybe it was not the best, uh, wouldn't have been the best fit for me. Um, biostatisticians, on the other hand, um, we are quite in demand, um, partially because of all of the um, demands for data in healthcare settings. So I made a good choice that way, even if it's not very creative. Okay. so. Um, not to put anyone on the spot, but does somebody want to volunteer to introduce themselves? Uh, me, her, oh. her mom, Vargas. Hi. Is it okay? Um, hopefully you can still see on the screen the questions. I can ask them if you like. Um, so where do you live? <laughs> okay, my name is Herman Vargas. I live in North Carolina. Um, I'm, a, I'm originally from Peru. Um, I'm a sailor. I'm in the U U.S. Navy. Uh -huh. I work in a clinic. I used to be a teacher. Uh, I worked worked as a teacher for ten years uh -huh. uh, back in Peru, but that wasn't my thing. I wanted wanted to change career, so I wanted to switch to uh, like uh, the medical field. And my last class was my internship to to get my bachelor's degree i did uh, my internship in my clinic the clinic where i work and i liked it because uh, i was able to change uh, a couple of things about my work uh, workspace like communication stuff uh, i did uh, like a project um, using lean six sigma oh uh, okay, yeah yeah so that, okay. that was it yeah, um, well, welcome to the class. And um, what you just mentioned as far as using the Lean Six Sigma uh, and those quality improvement type projects, that's, that's very high demand in healthcare settings. They, um, as you probably know, uh, there's 
a lot more accountability of hospitals now, not only in terms of patient outcomes, but also in terms of their pop, the population that they serve. And so hospitals now are more and more uh, invested in gathering data about their local communities. They're no longer just able to cherry pick patients that are the best <laughs> to make yeah. them good. They have to really serve their communities. And so there are a lot of people who are um, getting pulled into that. And that includes myself, um, not to make the focus on me, but um, the, um, you mentioned, you know, doing the quality improvement. And those are the kinds of things that are really good um, capstone projects for a master's of public health, where you can do a um, fairly quick turnaround of implementing some sort of change or some sort of intervention and measuring it and then starting those processes over again. So those, those often make pretty good um, projects if, if you are in a clinical setting. So um, thank you for that introduction. And let's go on to, uh, somebody else wants to volunteer. Hi, Nancy. Hello. <laughs> good. How are you? Good to see you again. Yes. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. Um, so my name is Nancy. I am originally from San Diego. I still am living here. Um, I'm trying to relocate to Seattle. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I had an interview recently and I've been, you know, um, contacted a couple other places as well. Um, I've been in healthcare for 17 years. Um, I started as a medical assistant and did that for over 12 years. And I primarily worked in OBGYN. Um, and, and then for the last just over four years, I was a perinatal educator at a community health clinic. Um, so it's fair to say that women's health is definitely my passion. Uh, that being said, I'm open to other areas of healthcare. I am trying to get into like the administrative side. I'd like to be in some sort of leadership role, but because of my uh, long clinical background, I'm finding that it's very difficult to transition um, into like the administrative side of things. So um, I recently completed my master's in organizational leadership, hoping that that might give me um, a bit of an edge, but um, my bachelor's is in public health, so I decided to come back to national for my uh, master's in public health. Um, let's see, one of my most memorable classes was probably uh, the very first class I took in at national was sociology. Um, I don't know, I guess I'm a big people person and um, Maybe that's why it really stood out. But also when I did my bachelor's program, um, I had the opportunity to go to Germany to do the study abroad program. So I'm hoping <laughs> that's an option maybe for this time as well. It was really a unique opportunity to see um, how different things, you know, how differently healthcare is run or even just considered as a culture uh, in Germany compared to the U.S. So uh, that's that's about that's about it for me. Awesome. Well, thank you. I, I learned so much more about you. Um, I know that you from <laughs> just having taken my biostats course. So, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's wondering why we knew each other already, that, that happens sometimes. Normally, this course is done first, but hey, whatever it doesn't. Matter. <laughs> um, it yeah, sociology is actually. Um, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because there is a lot of overlap between. The social sciences and public health and we do get students who have that background um, and that includes myself i started off as a sociology major in college oh, wow. and it was actually during the hiv aids epidemic that um, one of my professors who was a biologist said oh if i can only apply what i'm using here to the hiv aids epidemic 
Uh, and that was the first time I ever heard the word epidemiologist. So public health really wasn't even a, <laughs> a thing oh. <laughs> as far as a degree. There were degrees, but it wasn't available at my college. And so I have a warm spot in my heart for sociology. And I think it's something that is uh, really relevant as we emerge from this pandemic, right? That we Definitely. realize how much of our social structure and our healthcare system and everything else are determining the course of this pandemic more so than the science. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Science is pretty straightforward. The rest is, we got to figure all that out. So okay. um, great. Um, well, good luck with, I'm, um, I'm fingers crossed with your, um, up your recent interview and all that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I need to travel to do those kind of things. If I make it out there, I'll have to make a pit stop. <laughs> yeah, right here in Pioneer Square, they're having um, an art walk right outside the door. Oh, here. wow. I'm here to go check it out. Um, it's the first, they've, it's the longest running art walk in the country, at least they claim. Who knows? You know, it's probably not wow. art walk to claim that. I think they've been doing it since 1981. So that sounds pretty long for me. Wow. Um, but yeah, and so the pandemic really put a um, a stop to that, of course, yeah. um, especially to go into galleries, but now they're having, I'm trying to revive this neighborhood. So if you've ever been to Pioneer Square, it's um, kind of the art center of Seattle, um, down near Pike Place Market and all that too. So to know. Uh, a little tourist plug, gotta get this neighborhood <laughs> back in action over here. <laughs> all right, well, thanks, Nancy. Um, Thank you. Catherine, if you wanna introduce yourself. Hi everyone, um, my name is Catherine Colocato. Um, so I'm from San Diego. I've been here my whole life and I still live here. <laughs> um, and as far as my professional life, um, I've always been like working in like the medical field. I worked as like a CNA and then like a, an aide and um, I ended up going getting interested in like physical therapy when I was working at a nursing facility and I ended up getting my bachelor's degree from San Diego State in kinesiology. So originally that was like my plan, uh, but COVID hit and then that kind of like stalled things and I ended up getting a job at the San Diego County working in public health. Oh, so wow. that ended up like switching my whole thing and I was more interested in that. So that's why I decided to switch over to getting a degree in this and as far as like my best class I would probably say um I took a surfing class a few years ago um, oh. I'm afraid of the ocean so that was definitely like something that I never thought I could do but it was like a great feeling being able to um, actually catch that first wave wow that sounds amazing I um I'm envious of the act you can actually go in the water there up here in Seattle I shouldn't <laughs> it's cold. I mean, you can go in, but like, if you fall in, it's it's rough. So um, I'm still waiting for my old up uh, kayak so I can get out on the water. Um, it's been um, delayed in shipping apparently, but <laughs> that's awesome surfing. Oh, I should try that. That sounds so fun. I'm sure you overcame your fear pretty immediately, or I suppose it could make it worse <laughs> depending on how it goes. But. When Sounds I like, really like thought about it, when I was like paddling out into the water, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm really out here. And I would just try to like switch my mind to something else. But I mean, sometimes it would hit me. <laughs> awesome. Well, I know that um, I just saw that Shakira started doing skateboarding in her 40s. And I'm like, hey, I'm, I might even try that. <laughs> it's never too late to learn. Although I don't know if I have the hip movement right to do surfing but that sounds really fun thanks for sharing i'll have to do that if i come to san diego um i am coming down for commencement uh it was delayed until september so i'm excited i don't know if it's possible to go for surfing in september maybe that's when the sharks come I don't know. um all right so thank thank you for those intros let's see i am not great at seeing all okay so we have a small group i think there's about nine students registered in this section and again this is pretty informal um uh, this uh this course compared to others and so um if you have something that comes up don't feel like you need to um, pop into these sessions but it really is an opportunity for you to uh have some connection and also 
ask questions and kind of get get your feet <laughs> in this public health program. Now it sounds like from the discussion so far uh, that you all have a pretty good grasp of what public health is and uh, are already working in the field in some way or another, whether you know it or not. And that's one of the nice things about public health is that it does uh, encompass so much, so many different types of work, so many different types of interests. And in this program, we try to, as a generalist program, um, or at least the core courses, you know, kind of, embrace the fact that students do have these different experiences. And then within the specializations, that's when you can kind of get into areas of interest. Um, I will mention that one thing that attracted me to the national program was the fact that there's a concentration in mental health. And I do think that that is one of the more important and ignored areas uh, in both public health and medicine. And there's good there's good reasons for it, or I should say there are known reasons for it. Uh, they're not good reasons. Uh, lack of funding is one of the biggest problems with mental health, um, whether it's research or just doing um, mental health work. So one little biographical thing that I meant to share is my daughter is um, studying to be a nurse practitioner in psychiatric uh, nursing. So we both have, <laughs> I guess, very different interests. Mine's more research and she's um, working in adolescent psychiatry in Columbus, Ohio. So um, that's a little bio intro on me. All right, and thank you all for sharing with the rest of us. Right, I'm gonna click through here. Okay, so this course is self-paced. Uh, it says here self-paced within e within each weekly module. It's really self-paced over the four weeks. I do recommend, especially if this is your first course at National, to um, not <laughs> allow yourself to get, get a backlog of work and try to hit those deadlines as best you can, because other courses that you'll take will be more strict about deadlines and so on. Um, and there are... Um, weekly written assignments. These are not papers. These are not five page papers, please. Um, I would love to get samples of your writing to help improve your writing because writing is one of the more important skills in public health. You may not appreciate that. I teach biostatistics and you might think that I'm biased towards um, more quantitative <laughs> analytic approaches, but I think my biggest strength as a researcher uh, and as a public health person is my writing. Uh, and that's not to say that it, it, I mean, it needs a lot of work. It always needs a lot of work, but that's how we go about writing grants. That's how we go about writing papers and getting resources and being persuasive. And so the first um, lecture this week is about writing in public health. And it is really important to write um, persuasively. And anyone can do it. It's just kind of coming up with the right, um, the right, I don't want to say template, but the right um, idea about what you're really trying to do to write persuasive arguments, especially for writing grants. When you're writing an academic paper, you're going to use a different tone um, and different approach, but um, there are so many different audiences that we have to write for that you. Um, as you all know, <laughs> uh, we have a teacher in the room, we have a public health person, we have um, someone else who's been working in the medical field. And so we have a, a very broad base of people that we're trying to communicate with. And I think that's something that we need to learn to do better in public health in general is how do we communicate uh, to the public effectively because we've done such a horrible job. Um, in the recent pandemic. And it, it's fairly discouraging um, to see how errors in communication and errors in, in the way that we present our arguments uh, can have a really big effect on outcome and in, in terms of the course of the pandemic. So <laughs> being, being a good writer is, is good. 
Um, and also we use the same principles in writing as we do in oral communication. So when I cover the intro body conclusion in like week one, that's how a good speech should, should flow as well. I don't know if any of you remember back in the um, Ebola pandemic when Dr. Tom Frieden would speak on Ebola, not to say that he did a perfect job, but he always came with a prepared written statement that was well-researched and it always followed an intro body conclusion format. If you Google Tom Frieden, Ebola <laughs> press conference, you can see how well he did uh, in terms of um, being an effective communicator. And I think one thing we've lacked in the current pandemic, and this is not to like soapbox, but <laughs> just as an example, how the messaging in um, COVID has been very kind of off the cuff, a lot of room for um, interruption and not really getting the core messages out right. And so uh, if you want a, a good example of how to communicate, go back to the Ebola uh, 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 pandemic. If you want bad examples, you can find plenty out there right now. Um, there are weekly discussions and these are fairly um, open-ended, um, no real right or wrong answers. It's really to kind of get a, a sense of what some of your interests are and for you to kind of see what other students' interests are. So it's not a super formal thing. Um, don't worry too much about the, the length of it and so on, but just kind of answer the questions that are in those every week. And then the most important thing, and Nancy, you're you're exempt <laughs> um, because you just took biostats and you just did this. But um, ideally, um, everyone will complete the SAS programming uh, module. And SAS programming uh, is um, one of many ways that you can approach doing statistics. And depending on which agency you're in or hospital setting, they may use SAS, they may use something else, but they're all fairly similar. And so we wanna give you some exposure to using a statistical software package. Um, so that one especially, I recommend that you get started as early as possible so that you can troubleshoot any issues. So Nancy, like I said, <laughs> read easy. Um, but if you, didn't, if you didn't take the time um, to, to go through all the tutorial, uh, make sure that you, you do so. Um, and you will need to complete uh, and forward to me the certificate that you completed the SAS programming by the end of the class. So those are the requirements. Again, this is a one and a half credit hour class, um, different than others um, in that sense. So when I have, this looks a little different than what's in your syllabus. Oh, actually, no, it doesn't. <laughs> I actually cut and pasted it directly from last time. It, it was it looked a little bit different in terms of the colors, but okay, so this is exactly what it looks like in your syllabus. Um, so here we are Thursday and we're having our live Zoom session and hopefully you've had an opportunity to start to dig in on the lecture of the week that you've um, started to create your SAS user profile. Uh, make sure that you can do the little setup piece in the SAS profile. If you haven't done those things by now, that's okay. This is just a guideline for to kind of keep you on schedule. And notice that I also don't suggest doing more than one or two lessons at a time. You could hammer through it, but I just think you'll, you'll, <laughs> you'll tire of it after a bit. <laughs> and so um, just you know, do one or two at a time. And if you pace yourself, you'll have no problem finishing by the end of the course. Uh, so notice that the discussions and the written assignments are due at the end of the week. Um, that's true throughout the class. There are no quizzes, there are no exams. So just the written assignment and the discussion. The thing that people find the most um, confusing in this class is week three, um, I shouldn't say confusing, but I wanna clarify now that 
in week three, you're gonna do what's called a draft plan for your MPH competencies. This is just really an exercise to get you um, starting to think about what are the things that you're gonna to try to work on during the MPH program, especially for your um, capstone project, which isn't for a while, <laughs> unless you happen to be enrolled in this class towards the end of your public health program. But traditionally, this is the actual um, capstone project is done towards the end. However, we want you to at least see the different competencies and ultimately you will have to pick and, and get sign off on having attained those competencies. So really it's just to expose you to it. And if you already have an idea of what kind of experience you're gonna have for your capstone or some sort of internship or whatever, go for it lay it out in some detail. Otherwise, just kind of make it a hypothetical or kind of a wish list kind of thing of things you might try to do. So don't take that, don't take too much time with that um, in week three or get hung up on that. There are no right or wrong answers. It's more, again, just to clar start clarifying some of your interests um, and to expose you to those. Uh, in general, the lectures, are, and the weeks are themed. So the writing assignments correspond to uh, the lecture. So like week four um, with the systems thinking, I'm gonna have you do a systems thinking type diagram of your own choosing. So that's kind of the structure of the course. If you have any um, questions, feel free to interrupt me. I should probably look at the chat now and then. Okay, that's good, we're good. Okay, so, um, Getting started with SAS on the man, Gam, Nancy. <laughs> Wanna go for a short walk? <laughs> um, no, this one takes too long. Wait, uh, getting started with SAS on demand. Um, SAS is great because it's free, it's fully functional and um, very powerful. And the fact that you all can access SAS for free is pretty amazing to me considering what I shelled out as a grad student uh, to get access to statistical software, or I was very dependent on um, going physically to the computer lab or whatever to do my work. So um, it's pretty liberating that way to have access to these things. Um, but with that, when you're working in isolation and you're not in a lab, it's easy to kind of lose some of that culture that you get with learning in a lab. So um, in lieu of that, we're, I'm happy to work with you one-on-one -on -one in office hours, or if you just want to you know, schedule um, outside of office hours, that's fine, to get yourself set up with SAS. Um, it's, if you follow the steps that I put in the week one, and you watch the little video, getting started in SAS, uh, you shouldn't have any trouble. Um, it really shouldn't depend on what kind of computer you have because it's online. Uh, it's possible that Mac users may experience some, some different issues, but I, from what I gather, it doesn't matter um, whether you're using a PC or Mac. If I'm wrong, um, I can assist you on either platform, but that really shouldn't matter. It's all web-based. So um, what I will mention with the SAS on demand is that make sure that when you're doing the tutorials, you're always doing the SAS on demand tutorials and not SAS enterprise. It's a little confusing and I'll walk you through some of that next week in case there's any issues, but they kind of embedded two different trainings within one, um, one course. And so there's often an option for SAS on demand and then there's an option for SAS enterprise. You're gonna always wanna do SAS on demand. Um, uh, SAS is used widely in industry. It's used widely by academics. When I used to work for the Cleveland Clinic um, <laughs> back in Cleveland, uh, which is where I'm from, Ohio, we were actually required to use SAS. Uh, that was pretty much true in all hospitals that were doing 
um, or any research center that was doing clinical trials of drugs uh, uh, for doing statistical analysis. And the reason was if they're doing audits of research, they want it to be traceable so that they could run your code against the original data and reproduce the same results. Um, that requirement to use SAS uh, has been relaxed somewhat in clinical settings. And I think you can use R now as well. R is truly free and R is kind of uh, surpassing SAS in popularity because it is free. But SAS is actually more user-friendly in a lot of ways than, than R. And for most applications, it's perfectly adequate to use SAS. R has some nifty um, graphing capabilities and so on, but SAS, is, SAS has been in the game for a very long time and it's still a very good product. And it's free, yay, can't beat that. Um, so it, it is a little clunky as far as maybe what you're used to in terms of windows and structure of other programs that you're used to, it kind of has its own logic. And that is what the tutorials do a good job of walking you through. How do you bring in data? How do you, um, um, how do you write code and, you know, it's beyond the scope of this course to make you all SAS programmers, but it is a skill that is in high demand, uh, not only in research, but in industry and business and so on. The ability to program in general is obviously uh, important. And I'm not just saying that because I'm in Seattle, I'm not like a techie person, but um, the, um, the ability to do data analysis, let's just put it that way, is really high demand. Um, and especially in clinical settings these days. Okay, um, so if you have any issues, please don't hesitate to reach out. I will be more than happy to help you and walk through it. If you do have problems, what I suggest doing is take a screenshot of the problem or use the snipping tool and, and send it as an attachment. It's a lot easier for me to figure out what the problem is if you um, give me some heads up and I can think about it. <laughs> I'm not so good at troubleshooting online. I might, you might be like, you know, calling your cable company. <laughs> it could be a long call. So if you could just do a screenshot, um, I can figure it out. But I haven't had too many issues with that. So I don't expect you to have problems, but if you do, let me know. All right, and if I click share plans, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about doing PubMed searches. We're gonna wait with time here. Okay, um, PubMed is like one-stop shopping for research articles. Everything that my colleagues have published or myself is in PubMed. Um, it's where the scientific literature in public health sits. Uh, medicine, same story, it's in PubMed. Uh, and PubMed is just the public version of Medline, which is the more kind of <laughs> expensive subscription service, but everything that you want to um, access as far as peer reviewed medical scientific literature is in PubMed. So it's really great. And the only thing that you won't find there are whole books or, um, you know, there are some things that aren't indexed in PubMed, but ultimately as, as the research community, it would be unusual for a researcher to not publish in a journal um, that is in PubMed. <laughs> There's lots of incentives professionally to have your articles appear in PubMed. And so uh, what PubMed allows you to um, do is real um, get peer-reviewed literature. There's lots of stuff floating out there that's not peer-reviewed, right? So peer review, there are three or four experts who, um, and they usually have someone like a biostatistician, they have a content expert. So if it's on neurology, they have a neurologist or two that are on the review committee. 
Um, and they have other people who uh, are specific to that audience. So if I'm writing for the journal uh, uh, JAMA for surgery, Journal of American Medical Association Surgery, there's gonna be you know, not only a surgeon reviewing it, but somebody who's pretty well um, fluent in the current scientific literature. And so it's not a perfect process. It doesn't mean that bad articles don't make their way through, but it is a filtering mechanism to make sure that what is published um, is, is, uh, has merit and is rigorous. Um, and so, and over time it gets corrected if you know, others aren't able to replicate those findings or um, you can also sometimes read letters to the editor saying, hey, you know, this looks like it might have some sort of bias. Uh, and so there's that nuance to research that I think is being lost right now too in the uh, race with COVID. COVID is, a, is a, such a different pace than typical scientific um, evidence accumulates. And so people aren't comfortable with it. I think the research community and the public <laughs> aren't used to the pace of things. And so um, all the more important that our writing be clear. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples and uh, just make sure that you know about it because normally I would say, hey, this is the library and here are where the books are and all that. But in public health, you just go to PubMed. <laughs> um, and all right, so without further ado, let me uh, hook up here with PubMed. Okay, and I'm gonna back out of this. Sorry if I'm a bit awkward with my... Okay. Okay, okay so the way I get to PubMed is I just Google PubMed. And the actual URL is... Um, PubMed.ncbi and <laughs> NLM and NIH.gov. Those are the sponsoring agency. Um, okay. And so it's um, NIH National Library of Medicine are the ones who compile this and they oversee um, kind of the whole structure of this. But the journals are ultimately the ones that report these or supply these papers. So there's a search bar here in PubMed. And here I can type in um, a topic that I'm interested in reading about. Usually when I'm doing a research project, or I should say always when I'm doing a research project, I will do an extensive literature review. Um, maybe you know 20 to 40 articles to get started. Um, and then taking the bibliographies from those studies and, and reading those studies, it, depends, it kind of depends on the topic. Sometimes there's not a lot on that area. So does anyone want to suggest a topic that they're interested in so I don't have to make one up? <laughs> Sorry, you may have dozed off with me talking so long. Does anyone want to suggest a topic? You can put it in the chat. Uh, diabetes. Diabetes. Okay. And um, any specific population or any? Uh, di diabetes uh, type 2. Okay. And let's do something slightly more refined. Well, okay. We'll start with that and then we'll keep down. Cool. Type 2 diabetes. So um, just one thing to know, oh wow, the first article is just called type 2 diabetes. Um, that is not typical, but in this case, um, the first article that came up was actually just called type 2 diabetes. I didn't expect one to be called that. But uh, you'll notice that there are journals of all kinds. So the Lancet is kind of like the British version of the New England Journal of Medicine. It is a top 
um, uh, a top journal. Uh, here's one in physiology, the circadian etiolo etiology of type two diabetes. So these sound, these first two look like review articles as opposed to original research. That is something that happens often that every five years or so, um, people will do some sort of like, uh, not a meta-analysis, but like a, a review article of the current state of the literature. Um, so if you want a good starting point for finding other recent articles, sometimes these review articles are a good starting point because they will have a lot of um, citations. This is obviously a more specific topic, the circadian etiology of type two. Sounds really interesting to me, <laughs> um, especially because I just traveled halfway across the country and I am experiencing jet lag right now. Um, who knows what that disrupts. But the um, circadian uh, uh, pathophysiology, and notice that these are um, all in different journals. Uh, type two diabetes etiology, that's from diabetes care, risk factors for type two diabetes. Um, okay, staging. So you can start to get uh, a sense of the different articles out there. And you can also see the, <laughs> the rapid pace at which scientific literature is increasing. So in 2021, there were 6,807 articles just last year published on type two diabetes. Um, that doesn't mean it's like a super hot topic because you'll probably see this pattern for a lot of um, conditions or topics just because of the nature of um, the way scientific literature is increasing, but it is also becoming an increasing <laughs> public health issue. And so you would expect there to be um, a lot of articles. Notice in 2015, there were 10,000 articles uh, published. And so we're sort, oops, it's actually peaked at 12,000 uh, in 2020. Why is there a lull in 20? Well, not every article that will end up with a 2021 date is done yet, right? <laughs> so we're only probably through the year. Um, so it's only going up. That's a lot of articles to sort through. You don't want to read 11,000 articles. So you will want to do a more refined search. My suggestions are take a few articles that are dead on to what it is you're interested in. Um, you could take one of these review articles. You could, if you were, say you were specifically interested in genetic factors, um, metabolic factors, circadian etiology of anything you can do to ref you know, refine it, as long as it's you know, obviously what you're interested in, that can help you um, do a more refined search. Uh, those are, um, and so one thing you're gonna notice is that this one here, the circadian etiology of type two diabetes uh, it's a, it'll say right here, free PMC article. This means anyone could access this article uh, via the web and get full access to the original article. So if I click on this title, um, and usually what you get here is the abstract, you might get some tables and figures. But if I click over here, you can see the free full text edition and I should have the option of getting a PDF. I will find it. Hmm. I guess it wants me to do the pub reader format. Normally it'll have a PDF, but here is the actual entire article. Okay, so there's nothing lacking from this um, in terms of content. You have the full article, plus you have 
the entire uh, bibliography. And as I mentioned, if you find an article that you really topic wise is dead on to what you want, ideally they've done some of the legwork for you and also cited other sources that are important. So this is my strategy is to find articles that are really close to what I'm interested in and then seeing what others have cited. And that way you can kind of, um, or if they, if they talk about a topic within the paper, they may have a series of articles that hit that, that more specific topic. So this is always a good strategy rather than just trying to dig through the articles because the default is to simply have it organized by publication date and that is not ideal. So let me go back to All right, so the default is to order it by publication date, and that's not a measure of quality. Um, you can um, you can subset it where you only get the free full text articles, which is good because then you don't have to guess whether there's free full text or not. But then that limits you somewhat in finding all the articles that exist. But if you wanna filter it, you can that way. Uh, so what I wanted to mention is that even if it does not appear to have the free version available to you, you can request through our NU libraries, any article that exists. And we have um, cooperation agreements with other libraries where they can get access to the article for you. It would be really unusual for them not to be able to get access to an article. Uh, there's just these reciprocal agreements that we can share across universities, et cetera. Uh, it might take them a day to get it, but they will actually send you um, a PDF version of the article that you're interested in. So I don't expect any of you to be doing that <laughs> every day quite yet. But as public health professionals, and especially if you get involved in research at all, you're gonna to want to stay on top of the literature and occasionally read articles. Don't ever pay for an article. <laughs> there, if I were to click on, let me go back. There is, um, you know, let me naively go in here and, and click on, um, something that's not necessarily free. Uh, okay. I'm looking for a highfalutin. I'm gonna do JAMA. I'm gonna type in JAMA here which is the Journal of American Medical Association, if you didn't know. Um, free, free. Oh, wow, they're all free. That's good. Okay, here we go. This one does not appear free. So if I want JAMA full tax, I click here. Oh. Okay, yeah, so this one is not free. Oh, I got an ad from Lily and company. Um, oh, well, there's different steps here, but um, sometimes it'll ask you, hey, do you wanna pay $30 a day for this article? It's not a scam. Um, it's just that some people are impatient or they want the article and the journals do need to kind of stay afloat. And so they, they are based on subscriptions from libraries. And so our library subscribes to a certain number of journals. And because we have reciprocal agreements with other libraries, we can share across those libraries. So um, they ultimately do get um, some money for these articles, but it's really just to kind of keep the journal afloat in terms of production. Um, now that journals have moved away from physical copies, 
I don't know what their costs are <laughs> other than having a staff and having, um, you know, editorial staff who actually do the, um, you know, final preparation of manuscripts, um, which does take quite a bit of um, time and effort. So not to minimize the work that they do, but don't ever pay for an article is the moral of the story. Um, and you won't, especially in your academic career, would really never have, never have any reason to do that. So that's PubMed in a nutshell. Um, I'm not gonna do more refined search, but let's say I was interested specifically in adolescent um, type two diabetes, genetic factors, you know, you could just add keywords and that'll also narrow down your search. Okay, so I see that it is exactly seven o'clock uh, and that is the end of my um, formal presentation. <laughs> However, um, I did want to mention that uh, in addition to this course, I currently am your advisor as well. So uh, if you have questions that don't have to do with this course, but is about the program, you can also set up appointments with me during office hours, or if my, those Thursday office hours don't work, just at your convenience and we can chat about things. Maybe you're not sure about what course to take next or, those kinds of things. Now you do have another advisor through NU who can help you navigate those types of things like course selection. But let's say you have questions about your capstone as you get closer, or you wanna get involved in research, or you're just wondering you know, about job opportunities, anything that you're interested in, you can feel free to um, email me and we can set up an appointment um, and talk about it. So <laughs> I have quite a bit of experience with advising in addition to um, teaching. Actually, when I was at UW, I was, the, uh, I was in charge of the surgical fellows who were doing research here at UW uh, and helping them to get started doing research. And so that's one thing that I love doing is kind of creating a passion for doing research, whether it's on a small scale, a little, uh, bigger scale. So uh, do reach out to me if those are things that you'd like to get involved with. Uh, so if you have any questions, I have time to answer those now. You can also throw those into the chat. Hi, it's me again. Hi. Question, um, I don't know if you would know about the, I think it's called the global health experience. Mm -hmm. Is that still like you do either that one or the internship? Do you know how that works? Um, I know a little about it. I can also, um, it is something obviously with COVID, <laughs> we've had to scale back a little bit in terms of doing any kind of <laughs> global health travel. Um, but um, assuming that, we're talking a year or so from now, uh, when you'd actually do that kind of experience, the hope of course is to do something uh, um, uh, around that. Um, maybe even domestically, <laughs> there are opportunities as well uh, uh, to do that and we may work out something. I used to take students to Puerto Rico um, when I taught at Mercyhurst, partially because it was one of the cheapest flights. <laughs> um, <laughs> And also to have like a comparative public health experience because despite being part of the US, they had done quite a bit already on like rural healthcare access. They were actually doing a better job of providing rural healthcare access than a lot of the mainland US mm -hmm. um, pre-COVID and or not pre-COVID, sorry, pre-COVID, pre-Obamacare. Um, and they had to adapt, adapt their system to you know, a lot of the changes. And some of those were good and some of those weren't. So there, there, there's comparative work that can be done um, domestically. But to answer your question, as far as the details of how do I sign up and what's happening, um, I'll do this offline or I'll send it to the class. Um, but Gina Piani, who is the program coordinator, um, she has often led those experiences, but I will, um, I will send you contacts for that. But yeah, I hope that our students were interested in doing that kind of thing. Obviously, we can't plan anything right now with COVID. Right. 
And, and then do you know anything specifically about the, um, like the internship option? Yes, so usually students arrange those on their own, meaning oh. um, they have a site in mind. Um, they might even do something with where they're currently working and mm -hmm. kind of turn that into kind of more of an internship-like experience. We do have an internship coordinator um, who can provide guidance and resources for your own community. So if you're in San Diego, we have um, lots of different possibilities within San Diego area. Uh, if you're not in San Diego, it can be a little trickier for us to provide guidance because we have to make connections uh, or help you find connections. But um, if you're in the San Diego area, it's, there's a lot of people willing to host students. So I think it's um, a matter of narrowing down what your interest is. I will do um, a formal presentation on internship in week three. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna um, be less specific right now since we're wrapping up, but um, there, I will also provide you with all the people in our program. We have two people uh, who handle those. Um, one is Tanya Lawrence, and I will provide that contact info as part of the lecture. But if you're really eager to learn more, um, you can reach out to Tanya Lawrence, who's in the, in the MPH program, and she can help you navigate that. It's not my area of expertise, but <laughs> she will probably join us on week three. If not, I will have a recording of either her or someone else. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I just had a question about the writing assignment. Um, so we just pick an article and just answer those three questions only. Okay, let me make sure I <laughs> know which one we're talking about. Um, excuse me a second. And just so that everyone can see here some of the content. Y'all can see my screen, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And my view is a little different. <laughs> so it's gonna take me a second to get out. Okay, so right, so, um, oh, I guess I didn't attach it. Okay, it's just in here. Um, so for the first written assignment, you're gonna find an article in PubMed <laughs> that is on a topic that interests you. So don't do diabetes unless you're interested in diabetes. Um, oh, I actually put exercise diabetes. Um, so yeah, so after you've gone through the lecture where I discussed the importance of having an intro body conclusion. Uh, do answer the questions um, based on the article. So do the authors make a strong case for the public health burden and its relevance? One thing, that's one reason that we do the literature review that we do. We have to make a case for why it's important. On, even if we ultimately make one statement about the burden or its importance, we should have quite a bit of um, evidence that this is something that we need to prioritize. And the way we do that is through some sort of, um, usually some sort of statistic or, or um, estimate from the population that says, you know, it, this is something that affects 20% of the population, or this is, there's been a growing trend of, um, in this particular area. So COVID has kind of swamped everything right now, but let's imagine in a non-COVID time, you really have to make a case for what is the public health burden. So does the article that you chose make a, a good case 
for, for why they're doing a study. It doesn't have to necessarily be a purely public health paper, but something that, um, um, do they make a case for in the body? Uh, do they um, present the results clearly and do they avoid interpretation within the body? So ideally when you're presenting the body of a paper, it's very straightforward. You're just detailing um, your results and you avoid making um, too many uh, statements about causality or you know, the next steps for research, et cetera, you're just presenting your results. So to what did it do a good job of, of just kind of presenting results in a clear and concise way? And then in the conclusion, what the authors conclude or recommend as next steps. So the conclusion section of a paper is often called the discussion. So, so don't be confused there. There may not actually be a header that says conclusion or the conclusion may be um, a subheader and then there was a discussion before that. And I would call the discussion part of the conclusion. Um, so you feel free to use the, the discussion and the conclusion for that last one. So, but what do they, um, ideally you're gonna, after they've identified the limitations in their study, the strengths of their study, the core findings of their study, it should kind of set up um, a case for uh, what would be the next steps in research. What is it that we, now what do we need to know? Or now what do we need to do? So um, next steps could be more research. Next steps could be, hey, let's do this intervention. Um, you may have to read between the lines a little bit, but what are they recommending that we as a public health community or research community do next? So um, the most time, oh, and then finally give me, <laughs> give me the, uh, um, cut and paste the abstract so I can find the article. Um, I would be, you know, especially if it's something I find interesting, I might wanna read it too. Um, but uh, that way I know what the article was actually talking about. And so the bulk of this assignment is actually reading. And then you just can answer the questions based on your, your reading of it. So uh, that's a long-winded answer to your question, but yeah. So I would say focus on the reading and then your responses can be as brief as they need to be. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah, and this, this assignment is also a way for me to get to know what some of your research interests are, what some of your, not necessarily research interests, but just interests in general are. So um, that's my, my way of getting into your heads. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Well, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules. And I appreciate you showing up to the session and <laughs> giving me somebody to talk with. Um, no, but um, hopefully we'll have other students circle in in future weeks, but um, feel free to reach out if you hit any stumbling blocks. Otherwise, um, we'll see each other next week. And till then, have a good weekend. Enjoy the long holiday <laughs> if you get it. If you don't, still enjoy the weekend anyway. So I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.